Good evening. Welcome back to Cornerstone tonight. So glad to see you. Well, please stand with us and we'll sing song number 345, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day long. On the second, perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest, I am my Savior happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior in. Please remain standing for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for you allowing us to come into your house tonight. Lord, we're just thankful for how you bless us, how you just take care of us and watch over us. We thank you for what your son did for us on Calvary. And Lord, we just ask you to be with all those that are couldn't be here tonight because of illness. We just ask that you would uh, be with them and comfort them. Lord, again, thank you for being so good to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing the little chorus, The Family of God, page 282. Uh, this will be our handshake song. So at the end of the chorus, we'll turn around and shake hands. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. Turn around, shake hands, please. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. One more.
more time. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family. please. Well, hey, man, good to see you here tonight. Good evening. Welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church, and uh, we're still rejoicing in all the visitors that we had this morning. Wasn't that good to see the visitors come back and younger families visiting and things like that? I mean, that was great. And just, uh, we had Matt and Matt Price's dad and mother with us this morning. We had the, what's their name? What's it at? The, um, someone yelled their name, the, the, with the young daughter and the, who is it? Cooks, the cooks, the cooks with us, and we had, let's see, Pierre, and was it Rochelle? The, the lady with her, the lady with Pierre. Shirley, Shirley, good job, all right, and then it was great to see the visitors here this morning, and uh, man, it was great. So we have a couple of announcements for you tonight. Um, security, volunteers are needed. So if you're interested, yes, sir? Mrs. Haig, you're being summoned, all right? Um, so we need some volunteers for security, so if you're interested, please see uh, Brother Anderson with that. And let's see, we have the nomination slips are in the lobby, and I believe the nomination is over, so right from the floor. So we'll have the ballots for you soon, and then be in prayer for the business meeting coming up Wednesday, January 25th, and so just please be in prayer for that. The activity, the activity, if you haven't signed up yet, is going to be Saturday, February the 4th. And it's to Perfect North. And there's going to be snow skiing, tubing, ice skating, and more. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you're, yes, ma'am. No ice skating. I don't know where I got that from. But there's going to be a lot of fun stuff there. If you're interested, sign up in the lobby. If you need some more details, please see uh, Miss Goodner. And we're looking forward to a good time. Saturday, February 11th, uh, the teams will be hosting a Valentine dinner fundraiser. It's going to be great. It's going to be great food. And it's going to be for a good cause. The teams are going to be going to teen camp. And so $40 per couple, and that gets you a three-course meal. Appetizer, um, the entree, and then dessert. And there's a babysitting as well, so please sign up. Let's see. Saturday saturation will be January 28th at 10 o'clock in the fellowship hall. We'll have donuts and refreshments and then actually go out canvassing, um, weather permitting, at 11 o'clock. And then we're having a fifth Sunday format. Uh, January 29th, there'll be Sunday school at 10 o'clock, Sunday morning at 11, and we're having a pitch-in lunch in between, and an early afternoon service at 1.45. And everyone is welcome to stay for family game night. We'll play some board games, card games, and just have a good time together, and there will be snacks as well. And don't forget about the leadership conference, people that are newly elected into their new capacity, their new role, and their families, and anybody that's involved in a church ministry in leadership capacity is welcome to attend. We'll have a good meal at 5 o'clock right there in the church gymnasium, and then we'll have a charge from a speaker, and we'll also have some classes to break up into, and it'll be a good time. And some people on our prayer list, we had a prayer request submitted this morning, and it was for Bert Borden who has COVID and hospice is involved. That was requested by Jan Dore, and uh, her relationship with uh, that family is, uh, she's a sister-in-law. So please keep Bert Borden in your prayers. And also pray for um, the Abel family as they're dealing with the, lo the loss of their loved one. Pray for David Butler, that's Mrs. Ledbetter's brother with cancer, has a nodule. Uh, Miss Ledbetter is feeling um, better, but she's still sore. She's got a hairline fracture in her hand and also uh, pretty bruised up around her face area. And then Donnie Moser, it was good to see him this morning. Uh, he was in a very serious car accident, and the passenger side of his car was smashed in and touching his arm in the driver's side. And the police officer, when they first got there, walked past his car because they thought he was dead, and they went to the other vehicle. And so it was a very serious, serious car accident. So just um, please continue to pray for him as he recovers. And pray for um, Roger McNamara with the ear complication. 
Um, pray for Roger McNamara's friend, Ken Davis, missionary friend who was given weeks to live, and so many others on our prayer list. I want to give you an update on uh, Mr. Camacho. Uh, me and Pastor Haig went to go see him earlier before the service, and he's doing well. Um, he's doing great for considering he just had open heart surgery. He was already walking around, sitting up in the bed. And um, more importantly, we were singing a very fitting song, The Family of God. And a lot of people have been praying for his salvation. And he asked me if he could talk to me about some things. And he asked, he said that, you know, he was uncertain of some things concerning salvation and uh, just a little bit confused on things. And I just told him, brother, we'll just pray about it. The Lord will lead you to a, a decision if you're saved, if you're not. And he starts crying and says, you know what? I need to get saved right now. And was able to lead him to the Lord in his hospital room just a few minutes ago. And so he is saved and knows it for sure now. And just exciting to hear about that. And so um, rejoicing over that and uh, looking forward to tonight. We'll have the prayer for the offering and continue with the service. Just as a brief point of clarification, if you or a family member needs an absentee ballot, please contact myself or Brother Gerber, and we will take the information down of who needs one, and we will get that information to them before Wednesday's meeting, okay? Uh, dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to meet together this evening, that we can come together uh, and worship you, sing our praises, and uh, open up your word, and uh, touch our hearts with your Holy Spirit tonight, with uh, what Pastor Morton has for us. As we take up our offerings and our tithes, we ask you to bless those as we uh, see your work done here at Cornerstone as well as supporting our missionaries around the world. We ask a blessing on uh, those services, uh, as well as our Spanish ministry as it's uh, going on at the same time. Uh, open up our hearts this evening. Uh, bless that which is going to be taken up, that we can uh, see souls saved and lives changed for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Continue to prepare our hearts for the message from God's word tonight. Let's stand together, please, and we'll sing song number 460, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. All three, three verses of four, song number 460. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy? He through life has been my guide. Heavenly peace, divine is comfort. Let my hope be whatever befall me, Jesus do with all things well. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus do with all things things well. Perfect rest to me is promised 
in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed in mortal wings is fly to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Good singing. You may be seated. All right, before the message, Mrs. Morton will sing. of the ocean vast carved out the mountains from the distant past molded a man from the miry clay breathed in him life but he went astray come to me by choice. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I write the music for the whippoorwills. Control the planets with their rocks and rills. But give you freedom to use your own will. Even the oxen know the master's stall. Sheep will recognize their shepherd's call. I could demand your love, I own you twice, but only willing love is worth the price. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I write the music for the whippoorwills. Control the planets with their rocks and rills. But give you freedom to use your own will. And if you want me to, I'll make you whole. I'll only do it though if you say so. I'll never force you, for I love you so. I give you Jesus. Is it yes or no? I'll never force you. For so I give you Jesus. Is it yes or no? All right, thank you, Leah, for that song. And it's good to see you here tonight. If you got your Bibles, turn to John chapter 21. John chapter 21 is where we'll be tonight. John 21. And uh, anybody that's uh, interested in keeping track of the words, the word, let me, let me get here in a second, I'll tell you. John 21 is going to be an unusual word, but it's going to be fish, okay? So write down the word fish every time you hear the word fish, okay? Fish, fishing, any variation of fish, okay? John chapter 21, very familiar portion of scripture, um, but we'll get there in a moment. I don't want to don't overlook this. I was given this from, looks like January 18th, Wednesday during Kids Club. There are, there are three children that profess to know Christ as their Savior, and so we praise the Lord for all the workers that give of themselves and the time in the junior church and the kids' department. Looks like Chloe Mosier, um, Amaya Schultz, and um, I believe a boy named Benny. Is that right, Benny? And so we rejoice and praise the Lord for three souls that got saved in the kids' ministry, and that's a, a wonderful thing. So we're rejoicing in the Lord over that. Uh, John chapter 21 
And uh, we'll pick it up in verse number 1, read a few verses together. The Bible says this in verse number 1. The Bible says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. And I want to go back to those first three words, after these things. What does that mean? Well, what happened before John chapter 21 and verse number 1? Well, after these things. So look at it in John chapter 20. John chapter 20, and look at it in verse number 7. We begin to see what the things that just took place were that's being referenced in John 21, verse 1. The Bible says in John chapter 20, in verse number 7, And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. After these things, you know what that's referencing? The resurrection of Jesus Christ in John chapter 20. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ in John chapter 20. And then we see uh, Jesus appearing to his disciples at least twice in the later part of the chapter in chapter 20. And uh, look what it says in verse number, verse number 21. Verse number 19, go to verse number 19. It says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And then he gives them the Holy Spirit. So we see that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then appears before his disciples and tells them of the command to, to be a witness for him, so send I you. And he gives them the Holy Ghost. Look at it in verse number 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were with them, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So after these things in John chapter 21, verse number 1, was the things that just took place, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the appearance of, of Jesus to his disciples twice, and then commissioning them to go out and tell people about him and giving the Holy Spirit to them after these things. Now, I want you to just to know right out of the gate, there's two different possibilities about how to interpret this scripture. Some people will look at this and say that his disciples waiting for Jesus on the seashore were just bored. And they took up a recreation of going out and doing what they were doing before. Another interpretation of this scripture could be that Peter, in his mind, had had enough and was going to walk away and go back to the life that Jesus had called him from. Whether one you want to believe, that's between you and the Lord. But I believe, later on the scripture we'll see this, I believe that Peter, in his heart and his mind, was wrestling with the decision of staying a disciple, a fisher of men, or going back to be a fisher of fish that God had called him from. And I want to just challenge us this, this evening, in 2023, to not quit. To not quit. I want to encourage us to go forward for God and to be faithful for God and continue doing what we've done for the Lord and not quitting on the Lord this year. Not quitting, not giving up, not throwing in the towel, not being discouraged, not walking away, but staying faithful, staying put, and staying true to what God's called you to do. Isn't it easy to quit something? Right? It's easy to quit something. Anybody can do it. As a matter of fact, a majority of people do quit what they start. A lot of people quit. It's easy to do. It's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? Isn't it easy to get discouraged doing something for the Lord? 
It's easy to get discouraged when you look at uh, maybe the, your class, your Sunday school class, and it's not growing. There's only a few kids. Maybe you're in a, a position where you're dealing with young people, and it seems like you're not getting through to them. You're not getting their heart. It seems like there's no fruit in it. It, it can be easy to get discouraged. It can be easy to get discouraged as a preacher when you get up and preach and you share what God's laid on your heart to share with the people. And you've asked the Holy Spirit to move and nobody moves in the invitation. It can get discouraging. But I want to encourage you this. Even though we may not see immediate fruit, I'm telling you what, God's working. God will bless faithfulness. And I want this on my tombstone. Leah, if you're listening, I want this on my tombstone, okay? God blesses faithfulness. And I believe that with all my heart. I believe that God blesses faithfulness. And it takes being faithful and sticking to it and being consistent to see what the Lord is starting to do and will do. It takes you being faithful and sticking with it. Let me share a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Mr. Camacho, tonight, about an hour ago, prayed and asked Jesus Christ to save him in his hospital room. In the Community North Hospital. But do you know what? The reason that he was there in that place coming to Cornerstone Baptist Church where my path would cross to him and the Lord would, would direct our paths to be with him in the moment where he was sensitive and ready to call out on Jesus' name. A lot of things had to happen before that moment took place. Do you know what, who could be traced back and get a part of it? Shirley Williams. Shirley Williams is the reason that they even came to Cornerstone Baptist Church. He told me that in the hospital room. He started with a smile on his face. He said, you know what? I have Shirley Williams to thank for this because Shirley's the reason we came to church. Shirley's the reason we kept coming back to church. Shirley Williams in heaven is looking down in that hospital room, and she had a part in Jesse Camacho accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. You know what? That would have never happened had Shirley Williams quit inviting them after the hundredth time they told her no. She stayed faithful, and God blessed her faithfulness. God blesses the faithful prayers of uh, the, his Sunday school teachers and people that met him and befriended him. God blesses faithfulness. If we want God's blessing, we have to stick to it, be faithful, and wait for the Lord to, to work and move. I believe this. I don't believe for a second Peter was just rebellious and wicked and just, I mean, just an awful wicked sinner in this passage. I believe it could be discouragement. I believe it could be a problem of impatience because they were where Jesus told them that he would meet them. But maybe he got impatient waiting on the Lord. Maybe he was uh, tired of waiting and he, he felt like, man, I'm wasting my time and maybe I, I'm, I'm discouraged because the Lord told me he'd be here. He's not here yet. Maybe his mind began to wonder about, man, you know what? I had it pretty good as a fisherman. I had it pretty good as a fisherman. Uh, no, no getting persecuted as a fisherman. I wasn't getting uh, imprisoned as a fisherman. I wasn't uh, getting ridiculed and mocked as a fisherman. It could be, it could be that Peter in his own heart, standing on that seashore waiting on the Lord Jesus Christ, got discouraged and was thinking about going fishing. There's nothing wrong with fishing. How many of you like fishing? You like going fishing? I've never caught anything fishing. But I like it. I enjoy it. There's nothing wicked or wrong with fishing Unless you're deep sea fishing because I get sick. But there's nothing wicked with fishing. But I, I believe this. When he makes that statement, look at it in verse number 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. I believe this. I believe when Peter made that statement, he was not just going out for a recreational boat trip and fish trip. I believe he could be have contemplating throwing in the towel, walking away from being a disciple and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to bring out some things out of the text and challenge you and I, don't quit on the Lord. Don't quit. Don't quit. Stay faithful. Stick with it. God will bless and God will move and God blesses faithfulness. I go a fishing. I want to I preach on this thought, I go a fishing. And I want to specifically preach from the perspective of not quitting. And I believe this. I believe we can look at these verses and see the lies that a quitter tells himself. Lies that a quitter tells himself. 
about quitting. Uh, I'm glad for parents that won't let their kids quit something that they started. That's showing them that the importance of sticking with what you've committed yourself to. I'm telling you what, quitting only gets easier the more you quit in your life. A lot of people quit marriages. A lot of people quit jobs. A lot of people quit churches and quit places of ministry for a lot of petty things. I'm telling you what, God desires for all of us to stick with it, be faithful, and stay the course. Here's the first lie that a quitter will tell themselves. Simon Peter saith unto them. Who is the them? Well, let's keep reading. The Bible says this. And look at verse number, verse number 2. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Peter was not alone on that seashore. He was surrounded with uh, a half dozen or more disciples that were there waiting on the Lord Jesus with him. And I believe this, when Simon Peter, in verse number 3, tells himself and then uh, broadcasts it to the disciples that were nearby, I go fishing. He literally was saying, I'm going, look, you guys do what you want, but I'm out of here. I'm, I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of waiting around. I'm going fishing. I'm doing what I know. I'm doing what I'm comfortable with. I'm going back to the life of fishing. You know what? Here, I see the first lie a quitter tells himself. The first lie a quitter tells himself when they quit is I make decisions that will only affect me. I make decisions that will only affect me. He told them, I go a fishing. I believe this. I believe that Peter has thought this thing through. He's weighed the options and he's come to the conclusion that the best scenario for him in his life in that point is to go back to the life of fishing. And I'll tell you, I'll prove my point to you in a second. Stay with me. I go a fishing. Are you there? Read the next word out loud. What's the next word? Say it again. Say it out loud. They. They say unto him, what's the next word? We also go with thee. Do you know what Peter didn't underestimate when he made the decision that he was going to go fishing? He underestimated his scope of influence over the other disciples. He may have well made up his mind that in his life he was going to make the decision for himself that I'm going fishing. But you know what? People look to him as the leader of that group. People look to him and they said, you know what? If Peter's made up his mind to leave where we're supposed to be, and whether you think it was just recreational or him quitting on God, they were leaving where they were supposed to be to go fishing. And they said, you know what? If Peter's thought about this thing, and if Peter's made up his mind that he's going fishing, we're going to go with him. And I want to encourage you this tonight. Don't underestimate your scope of influence either. If you make the decision in your own heart and life that I'm quitting this whole life of living for the Lord and going to church and being a Christian and serving God and being faithful is overrated. It's not what I thought it was. It brings too much hardship and trials and struggles. I'm going fishing too. I quit. Before you do, before you make up your mind, there's always going to be a they that's going to follow you. There's always going to be a group of they that follow me as well. Think about it. If I decided right now that, you know what, preaching is overrated. Preaching's overrated. People aren't responding. And this is not the life that I envisioned as a preacher and what it, what it meant and what it entailed. I'm quitting on God. I know that God called me to preach, but I'm through. I'm quitting. Do you understand that decision is not only going to affect me? Guess who is going to be directly affected by my decision to quit on God? My wife, my daughter, my son, and my other daughter. They're going to look at a father that they were, they've heard that, that said publicly, God's called me to this. God's called me to preach, and I can't do anything else but preach God's word. And now, Daddy, in the moment of weakness, in a mom, moment of a valley and struggle, is quitting on what he said God called him and put him on earth to do. You don't think that's going to have an effect on them? It certainly will. 
Don't underestimate your scope of influence. You have children, parents, your children are watching you. And what they desperately need to see in your life and mine as a, as a parent is faithfulness, steadfastness. Yes, times are tough and things are getting hard and there's drama. Every time you deal with people, there's drama. Every time you are in ministry, there's problems. But they need to see mom and dad in the face of that opposition, in the face of the struggle, in the face of uh, uh, obstacles, faithfulness. Faithfulness. Because they've heard from your lips and mine that church is important, that God is worthy of our life, that God is deserving of our service. And when hardships come, they're going to see mom and dad after saying those words, we're not going to church tonight. We're not going to open our Bibles and spend time in God's word tonight. That in the first time someone says something that hurts you, you're, not going, to, you're going to quit on God. I'm telling you, the first lie that a quitter tells himself is that their decisions only, only affect them. Peter's proof of that. It's not true. If you quit on God, there's going to be a a people that are hurt and that are affected by it. I want you to see the second thing about a lie a quitter will tell themselves. Peter said, Simon Peter saith to them, I go a fishing, and they say to him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship. Read that word out loud, the next word. Immediately. Read it again. Immediately. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately the next lie a quitter will tell themselves is they can make a hasty decision and it will turn out good every time a lot of poor decisions were made in a moment of impulse peter is a de textbook definition of impulse decision when he took out his sword and i believe he was the one in the garden that uh, was trying to lob off the head of that guard and the guard missed and he cut off his ear that was impulse Jesus didn't need his help. He could have snapped his fingers and had a legion of angels come and rescue him. And Peter, getting ahead of the Lord Jesus Christ in a moment of impulse, took it upon himself to do what he thought best in that moment. Peter, in a moment of impulse, decided to follow God afar off. Peter, over and over again from impulse, put his sandal foot in his mouth. A liar will tell themselves they can make a hasty decision it's going to turn out okay. Nowhere in this passage do you see Peter and those disciples stopping and asking God what to do. Nowhere in the passage do you ever read the Lord, uh, Peter saying, you know what, guys, I know we're feeling this way. I know we're wanting to go fishing. I know we're leaving where God told us to wait for him. We're getting impatient. I know we're doing this. Let's stop and pray about it. We're not going to be led by feeling or emotion. Let's stop and pray and ask God to give us what we need in this moment. If it is a clear direction to leave out of here, let's leave. But we're going to wait and stop and ask God what he thinks we should do. You're not going to find that. Because the Bible tells me they went forth immediately. Didn't take time to think it through. Didn't take time to count the cost. They didn't take time to consider what Jesus had told them to do. They didn't take time to pray and fast and ask God to give them a clear direction over it. The Bible says they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. They just thought it. In a moment of impulse, they went with it. There is nothing good that happens out of impulse without considering and seeking the face of an almighty God before making a decision, before making a life-altering decision. And we need to pray about that. Consider, consider the source. A lot of times people get hurt. They get upset about something in the church and their first impulse is the answer is to leave and find a different church. You know what you're going to find in a different church? Other imperfect people that will hurt you if you give them a chance. A lot of people will, in the moment of impulse, when trouble, they just throw in the towel in their relationships with one another. And they say, I'm done. The answer is to leave. In a moment of impulse, they make the decision to walk away from their spouses without taking time to seek God's face and wisdom on the subject. It's definitely a lie that a quitter will tell themselves. I can make an impulse decision and it's going to turn out okay. What does the Bible say? And they 
went forth and entered into a what? Ship. Now, I don't know if this is a ship they had nearby. I don't know if it's a ship that they sailed to there with. I don't know if they rented a ship. I don't know. But they could have, in their own minds, justified like Jonah justified his decision, his moment of impulse decision to flee the presence of God. It could be that they justified their decision by all the circumstances lining up perfectly. Think about it with me for a second. They're making up their minds to go fishing. And in my estimation, leave what they were called to do. You know what, guys, should we really be doing this? Well, I don't, I don't know. Peter, Peter's in charge. He's telling us to do it. We should follow him. Yes, yeah, do it. And then, guys, listen, we need a ship. Where are we going to find a ship? Er, er, ship for rent. There's a ship right there, guys. No way. What are the odds? What are the chances that us leaving where God wants us to wait patiently for him, there is a ship that will take us exactly where we want to go. People make too much out of circumstances sometimes. They justified their decision because everything lined up. The Bible says that they, they forsook, when God called them out of there, they, they left their nets and the ships behind. Where did they get all their fishing gear? Where do they get all the nets and the anchors and all the bait and all the things necessary for fishing? Casting the net and all the ropes and equipment. Man, everything's here. This ship that we're on, the ship that we found has everything we'll need to go fishing. God's in this thing. Everything's lining up. Let me remind you something. Guess who is considered in Scripture to be the prince and power of the air? Satan, you don't think for a moment that the devil who is a prince and power of the air, who's walking around seeking whom he may devour, is not capable of orchestrating the, the elements and circumstances to take them away from waiting patiently where God told them to wait. You don't think that's a, that's a coincidence? Could be the devil was in there orchestrating everything to line up to convince them that their impulse decision was the right decision. You know what they did? In their heart and mind, they were going to be successful. I'll give you one reason why I believe they were running from God. Because if they were, in fact, just going out recreationally fishing, why would God withhold fish from them? Well, he was going to prove a point later, but we'll get there. Look what it says in uh, the last part of verse number three. In their mind, they were good at what, church? Fishing. What did Peter know more better than breathing? Fishing. I believe that Peter was, was raised up around those waters and he was part fish. He knew where the fish were. He knew where the fish's schools were. And that's before, that's before Garmin and fish finders and all the technology. He knew where those fish were. Guys, I promise you, if you'll follow with me, if you'll partner with me, we're going to be successful. I know this lake like the back of my hand. I'm a fisherman. That's what I was born and bred to do. Fish, 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 fish. We're going to be successful. Notice the last part of verse number three. And that night, they caught what? Nothing. They caught nothing. The next lie that a quitter will tell themselves is that the reality is going to be great. In perception, they forget all about it. What, what, was, their, what was their perception of what they were, their course was going to be? Their course was going to be successful. We're going to be raking in the fish, raking in the dough. We're no longer wondering where our next meal is going to come from. No longer sleeping out on the stars. We're going to have everything that we need by catching these fish. That was perception. And the perception of a quitter is they're going to quit what they're currently doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to quit going to church, quit on God, throw in the towel. And the perception of that decision is it's going to be better. It's going to be better. That's the perception of a quitter. But what is the reality of someone who quits on God? They caught nothing. I'll tell you what, the lie the devil tells young people all the time is your parents got you in this church. 
I mean, your parents got you in a church that's old-fashioned, and they preach what the Bible says, and they have uh, teen rallies, and every time uh, we have an activity, the porters are going to bring out the Bible, and they're going to have a devotion and talk about God, and they're going to take us out soul winning, and our church is always doing something, and we got standards, and we got, man, oh, man, the devil's going to come by and tell our young people, you know what, man, quit this stuff. Just throw in the towel. Stop coming. I mean, you drive a long way. Stop wasting your gas coming to church. And you know what? You guys are investing yourself in a youth group. It's never going to grow. It's never going to do anything profitable. Just quit on God and experience the fun that your, your public school friends and your other outside of church friends are experiencing. And they have no rules. And there's no regulation. There's no curfew. There's no standards. You know what? Quit what you're doing for God and just enjoy the life that's outside of church in God. That's perception, young people. What is the reality of that? The reality is what you'll find is what Peter and those disciples found. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing to it. And I'm telling you what, that's not from a position of a young man that was sheltered his whole life and never experienced the world. That's someone that was almost lost and consumed in the world. As far in the world as you can get. And I experienced this for myself. And the reality is just that. There's nothing profitable there. There's nothing in this world that's going to give you what the devil paints up that what it's offering you. The reality is there's nothing. There's nothing profitable quitting on God and being outside of the will of God. There's nothing. Here's the next lie a quitter will tell himself. The Bible says this in verse number four, but when the morning was now come, I like this part, I like this part, Jesus stood on the shore. Sometimes when you're going through hardships, you think, man, Jesus is nowhere within a country mile of me. Jesus didn't take notice of what I'm going through. Man, Jesus doesn't care about me. And those disciples, when they're in that boat, and they've invested everything that they had, maybe they rented the boat, maybe they bought nets, who knows, but everything they had is invested in this venture and they've told in their own strength and their own ability and their own might. And they struck out. They're sitting there in an empty boat, empty bellies, empty nets. And they're thinking, we just blew it. We just blew it. And I believe at this point, I believe at this point the reality is starting to set in. Do you know what, guys? What if Jesus gets angry with us? What if Jesus is already there where, we're, where we were supposed to have been waiting for him? What if Jesus tells us, you know what, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of dealing with you rebellious, uh, faithless, I mean just backslidden disciples. I'm washing my hands clean of you. Peter, do you think Jesus will take us back? Peter, do you think Jesus is done with us? And I can just imagine in their hearts, when they're thinking those thoughts, they look up and where is Jesus on the shore? Where is Jesus in our own lives when we feel that way? I've gone too far. I think I've honestly gone far, farther than the hand of an, a merciful God could reach. Do you know where you'll find Jesus? Where you left him. Where you left him. He's waiting for you on the shore. Man, I like that verse. He was standing there on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, they saw a figure. Maybe it was a, too great of a distance to make out that it was Jesus. They saw a man on the shore but didn't know it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? Can you imagine this? Jesus already knew the answer. He's the Son of God. He knew that they were empty in that boat. You know why Jesus asks questions he knows the answers to? Not for his sake, but for our sake. Can you imagine this? They're sitting there and they're they're folding up their empty nets. They've got nothing but algae on there. And all of a sudden, there's this guy asking, you got any meat? They're all looking around at each other. No. Nope. Notice what he says. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. You don't think we've already done that? I mean, we've... Sh we we have cast this net in every square inch of this river, this, this sea. And this guy's telling us to cast the net. Well, what do we have to lose? They cast therefore, and now 
they were not able to draw it for the multitude of what? Fishes. This is a, this is a picture, I believe, of the mercy and grace of God to wayward, backslidden sinners like you and I. Don't we fail him every day? I mean, if you're honest, I mean, we fail, we fail Jesus every single day of our life. What could he possibly want with disciples like this that say when they're supposed to be waiting patiently for Jesus, they take it upon themselves in a moment of impulse to do what they want? What can Jesus do with them? What could Jesus possibly do with backslidden, hard-hearted, rebellious, stubborn sinners like you and I? A lot. God's merciful. And God, just because he can, just because he chose to, blesses them in spite of them. Blesses them. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Let me ask you a question. What finally clicked in, in John's heart, John the Beloved, what finally clicked in their hearts and minds that made them realize that figure on the shore that called out to us was Jesus. It was after they caught fish. I believe they understood it was the Lord when they considered the loving care and nature of God. They knew they were in sin. They knew they were away from God. They knew in their strength they struck out. And this person told them to cast where they had just cast. And God blessed them. And they knew that's the Lord. Who else would bless us like that? Who else would tell us this? It's the Lord. And notice this, it says, it, uh, Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Why would Peter just take off all of his clothes and jump in the ocean, jump in the sea there? Why would he take off all of his clothes? I believe this. He was removing anything that would hinder and slow him down to getting in the presence of the Lord. If you ever swimmed in clothes before, maybe you fell into a lake or a pool, man, your clothes get heavy, your clothes get soaked with water. It's difficult to swim when you got wet clothes hanging you up. Peter wanted desperately to be in the presence of the Lord, and he was willing to do whatever necessary to remove those things that would oppose him from getting there as quickly as he could. So he took off his clothes. And there's definitely a principle in that. Whatever it is, that is hindering your walk with the Lord or mine, we should be able to eliminate it, remove it, cast it off, so we can enjoy the presence of an almighty God. And the other disciples came in, in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were, 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there. And what's the next word? And fish laid there on. Man, Peter had nothing but fish on his brain. He was going to go fishing. He was going to catch fish, make money off fish, eat fish. Fish was going to be his life from this point forward. And just as a gesture, can you imagine this? I know Peter was anxious to get in the presence of the Lord. But can you imagine maybe a little bit of anxiety? You know, what am I going to encounter when I get into the presence of the Lord? Am I going to be met with chastisement? chastisement? Am I going to be met with uh, rebuke? Am I going to be met with correction? What is going to be my fate once I get in the presence of the Lord? Can you imagine Peter walking up there close to Jesus and guess what? Jesus had a campfire going and he was roasting fish for Peter and the disciples to eat. Showing Peter that I believe that campfire fish meal was a, was a a testament that God was willing to forgive them. God was willing to forgive them. And get this, Jesus, Jesus' will and Jesus' plan for your life and mine is always greater than our plan. Do you know what Peter was trying to catch? He was trying to catch fish. He was trying to make fish his life and consumed with fish. Make money off fish, eat fish. Jesus had fish laid there on and what? bread. Peter, the best that Peter could do for himself is just catch fish and eat fish, but Jesus had something even better than what Peter had envisioned for his life. He had bread and fish, fish and bread. 
Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up, drew the net to the land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Now you can disagree with me on this. I believe there is a picture even in the meal that Jesus Christ provided for his disciples. Jesus Christ was trying to get a point across to Peter because Peter was consumed with the wrong fish. God had called him to be a fisher of men. In a moment of impulse, he reverted back to being a fisher of fish. Jesus Christ, by the fish and the bread, the meal that was provided, was reminding them of the job that he called them to do, to be a fisher of man, and remind them that he was a bread of life. And the Bible says this in verse number 12. Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Do you know what they don't bring up anymore? Whenever they're in the presence of the Lord. Whenever they're sitting there breaking that bread. Tasting that fish that Jesus Christ prepared. You know what they, they weren't consumed with anymore? Fish of their own catching. Going out and making a, a new name for themselves, a life for themselves. Worried about their income and their financial status. The only thing that they were interested in was being in and enjoying the presence of the Lord. Might I submit to you tonight, that was God's plan and will all along. They left the presence of the Lord. They left the purpose of the Lord. They left the will of the Lord. They could have enjoyed that presence all along. And it breaks my heart. I'm not angry with people that used to be in church and are not anymore. I'm not even angry with people that used to be members of this church and now are members elsewhere. I'm not angry with people, uh, young people that are wayward that used to be in the youth group and aren't. I'm not angry with people that sat an invitation and heard the gospel message and was convicted and chose to leave rejecting the gospel of Christ. Do you know what I feel for them? You know what I feel for people that are out of church, out of the will of God, struggling with a whole world of things? I feel bad for them because you know what? They could be enjoying something that you and I are enjoying right now. The presence of the Lord. They left in a moment of impulse Someone offended me in church. Someone did, did me wrong. A pastor said something I didn't like. A youth pastor told me I had to wear this. They're no longer in church. My heart breaks for them because what they're missing out on is what Jesus wants desperately with them. A personal walk with him. And he wants them to enjoy his presence. Because people, listen, when we're in the presence of the Lord, there's, there should be nothing else that matters. When you taste and see that the Lord is good, that should be the only thing that we hunger and thirst for is more of his presence. Look what it says in verse number uh, 15, uh, verse number 14. This is now the third time that Jesus, Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that, he was risen from the dead. Three times he appeared before them. That made me think of how many times does it take for someone, maybe here tonight that doesn't know Christ as your Savior, how many times, how many invitations is it going to take? How many times does the Holy Spirit of God have to convict your heart and prick your heart and say you need to be saved before you'll get saved? How many times does God have to impress upon your heart to take that step of faith? How many times does God have to speak to my heart and your heart before we'll heed him and be submissive to his will? How many times does he have to appear before us before we'll get the picture and do what he's telling us to do with our life and just be submitted and obedient? Verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to who? Simon Peter. You could disagree with me, but I believe the, the discourse that we find between him and the Lord is proof that Peter was struggling with something in his heart. 
I mean, why else would why else would Jesus why else would Jesus be asking him these questions? And directly, who else was in that boat? Peter and the disciples. But Jesus begins to address Simon Peter first. Why is that? Because he was the one that said, I go a fishing. And he was the one, instead of using his influence as a leader of those disciples and leading them to be faithful to God, he used his influence to lead them away to go fishing. The Lord was addressing Simon Peter, the one who initially made the decision to, to leave and go fishing. He addressed him first. Notice what he says in verse 15. Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than, what's the next word? These. What are the these? Lovest thou more than these, your fellow disciples? Is that what we're talking about? Lovest thou more than these? Can you picture it? Can you see that? The fire's going out. They've already dined, and so they're full. And there's some leftover fish in whatever vessel he used to prepare the fish. Can you see it? I believe it was somber. It was quiet, sincere. Jesus knelt down and picked up those fish and said, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Do you love me more than you love fish? Do you love me? Do you desire what my will for your life is more than these? Are you at the place now? Have you gotten the point now that you're supposed to be loving me? Or are you still struggling with these? Simon Peter struggled. I believe there was an internal struggle. Fisher of men, fisher of fish. Struggles of ministry, plenty of money. Hardship, persecution, suffering, of life, a life of luxury, ease, and all that my heart could wish. A heart, a, 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 a absence of family and the presence of friends. An absence of family and the presence of friends. Presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simon, do you love me more than you love these? Do you love me more than you love fish? What does he say? He says, he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Then why did you leave what I called you to do? There's a flock of people out there that need your leadership, that need your strength, that need to follow your example of faithfulness. He used her to flock, like, uh, lovest me more than uh, uh, feed my lambs. Lambs, and then he goes on to say, sheep. And then in verse number 17, feed my sheep. Sheep and lambs, they're, they're, they're animals that are prone to wonder. They're animals that need constant protection and supervision and guidance. You left the lambs and the sheep that need you, Peter. More than, than being in, you influencing your fellow disciples away from God's will. Do you, know, do you know, church, there's a group of people out there that will suffer if I throw in the towel and if you throw in the towel and you quit on God? Guess who those people are? Sheep. There's two applications you can make that sheep. The flock that is your church family. The people that would suffer if you threw in the towel and quit, they would get hurt by that. They would see you quit on God and maybe want to follow suit. Maybe get discouraged and hurt and follow you in quitting. But also there's a, there's a whole, whole flock outside these walls. There's a whole flock of people that are lost, that are wandering aimlessly in life, that are, that are willing like a sheep would to jump at the first thing that calls itself the truth. The, the sheep that are w willing to, to, fly, to, to flee and to wander, they're, they're, they're going to jump at the first thing that tells them they need to do to be saved, even if it means work salvation or everything else. There's a group of people that are lost outside these walls that if you quit and I quit, would never be reached. Would never be reached. So church, I want to ask you a question. Do you love the Lord 
more than whatever it is that you could put in that place. For Peter, it was fish. Some people, it may be career. It may be career. I'm not talking about working to provide for your families, because that is biblical. But some people are so consumed with the advancement of their careers, they will let nothing get in the way of advancing that career. And the thing that suffers is their walk with God, their faithfulness to church, and the things of the Lord. I'm telling you right now, there's no career worth quitting on God over. My family, my grandpa owned a a million-dollar semi-truck business, and I used to work on semi-trailers. I was a reefer technician. When he found out, man, he was chomping at the bit. He wanted me to take over the family business. And I told him, Papa, I can't. Why on the world are you passing up on this? You could be next in line to inherit this business. It's profitable. You're going to make a lot of money. I'm called to preach, Papa. God's called me to preach. If I take that job and not do what God's called me to do, I can't do that. Didn't understand it. I'm sure your families don't understand the decisions you make either. Why do you come back to that church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival services, and so on? You're too involved in that church. Not if you love the Lord more than these. Maybe it's, maybe it's sports. I love sports. I love sports. But a lot of people get consumed with their kid being the next baseball star, football star. Man, there's clubs for everything. They got uh, taekwondo, jet skiing, baton twirling, ribbon tying, sewing club. They got everything you can imagine as far as activities. I'm telling you what, do, do you love the Lord more than those? You can fill in the dots because you know you better than I know you. But I want to challenge us tonight, don't quit on God. If Miss Shirley Williams would have quit, who knows if Jesse Camacho would be saved right now? Pastor Mitchell quit first time trouble happened. Wouldn't have hardly any of this. You quit. What's going to happen with those Sunday school kids? You quit. What's going to happen with those bus kids? I quit. What's going to happen to church? Our families. Don't quit on God. God blesses faithfulness. I had the privilege, I'll close with this, I had the privilege of in Florida uh, being there and seeing old friends and faces and was a youth pastor at my home church for seven years. And sometimes when you're working with young people, man, you don't see any fruit. And you begin to wonder, am I really getting through? Am I out of touch? Have I lost the connectivity with the young people? Man, I just feel like a failure. And I, I may have, I'm not taking credit with anything I'm fixing to say, but I want you to say, God bless his faithfulness. I was there, and a young man tapped my shoulder. He said, hey, Brother Morton. And I turned around and looked. It was a 23-year-old bus kid that I had in the youth group when he was like 15 or 16 years old. He's 23 years old. Come to find out, his family wouldn't take him to church. So he was dependent on the bus. And when the bus, would, when he graduated out of the Sunday school ministry, you know what he started doing? driving himself to church he said pastor morton or brother morton i've never missed a service i'm always here when i can it's a bus kid faithfully in the house of god doing great it's gonna be a sheriff deputy i mean i'm telling you what doing a great job sisters getting a doctorate degree being a fit uh, being a, ch- a child's therapist from fsu doing great things with their life then we another guy that i had probably since he was 13 or 14 years old in the youth group he said, Brother Morton, I'm getting married Saturday. Wow, man, awesome. Come to find out he was sings in the choir, met his wife in church. He's in church. He serves in the children's ministries. He's going to marry his wife. They're going to stay in that church, and they're going to grow and raise their children in that church. Would have never happened had we quit doing what we were called to do with the youth group. The whole point I'm trying to make, church, is this. If we want to see stories like that, we want to have more Jesse Camachos get saved. God blesses faithfulness. Faithfulness. It may take 10 years, 7, 10 years of working as an assistant and youth pastor 
10 years to see fruit. Let me ask you a question. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is a bus ministry worth it seeing one Anthony Coleman? Is a Wednesday night kids club worth it? I mean worth preparing the lesson plans over and buying the candy and dealing with the noisy kids and the pickup and the cleanup. Is it worth it? Let me ask you this. Is it worth three souls getting saved last week? Do you love the Lord more than fish? Dear the Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. Without it, we'd be lost. God, I, I know that you bless faithfulness. And above everything that I could ask this year for myself, for my family, for this church, is that we'd be faithful. Faithful doing what you called us to do, what you've laid on our hearts to do for you. Help us to be faithful. When times get tough, help us to be faithful. When the kids aren't responding, help us to, get, help us to be faithful. When the kids aren't getting up and waking up and getting dressed and coming on the bus, Help us to be faithful. Faithful in little. Being good stewards of what we have now. Prayerfully anticipating what your plan and what your vision is to do this year. God, I believe if we're faithful, if we trust you and we keep working, you're going to bless us in a mighty way. And I'm asking you to do that. And I know you're God enough to do that. Please bless us this year. For those that are weary, burdened down, struggling, please bless them, Lord. Strengthen them. Touch their life. For those that are hurting, recovering, taking chemo, dealing with injuries, dealing with cancer, the unknown diagnoses and unknown biopsies, Lord, please, God, please strengthen them and encourage them. Help them. Make your presence real with them. Lord, help us as a church family to rally around them and be there for them when they need us. We love you, and we'll ask that you bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Would you please stand to your feet tonight? Whatever God's spoken your heart about, please do business with the Lord. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we? I'm sorry. I want to share this with you. Um, the music can keep playing. I want to share this with you. Uh, Mrs. Camacho, Mrs. Camacho said that she she doesn't know how she and her husband could get through this without Cornerstone Baptist Church family. She said that it was amazing how quickly the church embraced them into the family. They felt like it's, we've been here all our whole life. That's just a, one example of what we can do for each other and what a difference it makes to have a heart of concern and compassion for each other. Can't think of, uh, can't think of in my own life how we could get through the things that we've encountered in our lifetime without Jesus Christ and the Comforter within us, the Holy Spirit of God, the Word of God, but a church family too. I want to wonder tonight if maybe you're here and you know you're not going through struggles, but you know somebody who is. My soul, we have a long prayer list tonight. Maybe you want to pray for somebody that you know is hurting or struggling. Maybe it's somebody in your family that's away from the Lord. Maybe you know somebody when we were talking about people quitting, the Lord brought to your mind. Not judgmental, but you're burdened for them. 
Why don't you pray for them? Call their name out to God and ask that they would bring them back to Him. As we, as we, as we sing, this will be the last verse. Whatever God's led you to do, just please do as we sing. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Thank you, appreciate it. Well, it's been good to be in God's house, and it's good to see the visitors this morning. It's good to see uh, you folks here this morning, uh, this evening, faithful. And I want to encourage you to tend to faithfully pray for those in our prayer list, those that were protected from difficulties and car crashes. But there's a lot of people here that still need, still need the Lord, still need the Lord's uh, healing, protection, and guidance. And so I want to just, as we dismiss in prayer, just continue to pray for those in our prayer list those that are hurting and struggling, and um, pray that Lord blesses us this year as a church and as a church family. So, um, Pastor Haig, would you just miss in prayer, please? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the faithfulness of these folks here tonight, and for those that can't be here, Lord, we just pray you keep your healing hand upon them. Lord, we know that prayer works in a mighty and special way, and we just thank you for each and everyone being faithful to their prayer life, and, and we see the results today. We've seen the results this week, and uh, Brother Moser, just you put, putting your hand upon him in that car accident, Lord, anything could have happened, but we know your protection was upon him. We just thank you for those that have been praying for him. Thank you for those that have been praying for the Camachos, and Lord, just, we want to answer the prayer today, and uh, it's been such a good day in, in God's house today, and, and kids getting saved on Wednesday night. We just thank you for those. There are people that have been praying for this uh, this day to come and, and this week. Lord, just pray you help us continue to be faithful in our prayer life and uh, help us to be faithful to church, Lord. As we come together, we strengthen our faith and uh, Lord, help us to keep on and keep pressing on for you. Thank you for the message tonight from Pastor Morton. Lord, just be with his family. Put a hedge of protection around this church and his family as well. And we just thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.